like it. Hi, I'm Tom Blomain. Welcome to Graffiti. We're here in the Evans Dining Hall in the Hibbert Campus Center of Keystone College to uh, witness the release of Five Poets, the book by Nightshade Press, Keystone College Books, that yours truly edited. And um, we're going to hear from all five poets to do a reading here today. Hope you enjoy it. Sit back and uh, just listen. Graffiti, Rose Five poetry, Poets, um, Lynn Marie Petrillo, No Interview. Tells, I hope, Mark a story, it. because I believe that all of our lives are really collections of prose poems that, in the end, tell the story of us. It is called Not All Embraces Can Be Balanced. In my death fantasy, I am a flower tied among trees. You come every day to worship me, but the wind and the rain and the absence of ground browns the tips than the bellies of petals that were once blue and purple. My roots melt, stem slides to the earth, and rotted flesh flies away, airy as ash. In my death fantasy, I can be read by atoms, every particle consuming every line I ever felt. I become fluent in the sign language of pines, oaks, and maples translating how they love, what they've endured, all the secrets. I can smell the fear pheromones of foxes and the birth sacks of bunnies and the inheritance of crows. When the strings surround nothing more than my bones, even my skeleton wants to travel so that you will no longer be able to tell with certainty where I am and how fast I am going. I remember the darkness and the fire through which we ran without knowing where or how fast we were going. I remember miracles and that not all miracles survive. In my death fantasy, I want to be burned when I die. In my death fantasy, all embraces can be balanced and all good is unhurt, linked, and limitless. Thank you. Graffiti Five Poets interview Language Robert Dugan market. It would be nice if the more people read it uh, and you can get it out there. But if no one ever read it, it wouldn't stop you from writing. It wouldn't stop me from writing. I just love writing and um, expressing. Uh, I like to think that I kind of try to draw uh, pictures and paintings and words and things like that. And this is a. Um, a historical setting um, from the Song Dynasty, and it was an, uh, a prince, a Chinese prince called uh, Xuan Song, and he had the unfortunate experience of falling in love with a commoner, and was so in love with her that he kind of became a little bit too preoccupied with the woman and didn't pay much attention to ruling. So Xuan Song and the Lady Yang. In winter, she complained the bare branches were too bleak. His men covered the trees with leaves of real silk. Each night, he ordered the signal fires to be lighted for a thousand miles outside the city, just so he could watch her walk naked to the terrace. When the execution stopped, the soldiers stayed in bed and shouted back their orders. From every province, taxes stopped coming, and the officials sat down with their people. In the end, the palace surrounded, he took her with him and hid in a well. Tied together for days, they hung there, nothing to do but make love, until discovered by the court eunuchs. Um, the next piece is um, Bruegel's Hunters in the Snow. The sky the same icy green as the ponds and stream. Everything is hard and frozen. Heads bent, stiff with intent, the hunters make their way toward the edge of a hill, too steep to descend, unless there's a path not visible in the picture. Their dogs, ignoring rabbit tracks nearby, root for scents or scraps in the snow. Despite the brittle cold, people seem to be enjoying themselves. A pond is covered with skaters and boys playing hockey. A small girl warms herself by a raging fire while a peasant sets up a table for a meal before the closed-down tavern, its sign hanging from one hinge. 
In the background, mountain peaks like the edges of broken bone jut toward the sky. A bush in the foreground and the branches of every tree appear stiff and ready to crack with the cold. Scattered about, crows watch, alert and hungry, like men condemned, sentenced to live inside birds' bodies. Graffiti by Poets interviews David Elliott, Market. Well, and the, th the thing is that, that even more than a snapshot or a video, I think, when you capture something like that in poetry, every time I read those poems, you know, I'm right back there when right. the, with the experience. Yes. That one of the things that happens at poetry readings, which really hardly ever happens in any other public gathering, is people get up and talk about their most private feelings. Right. Yes. And share it with people that often they don't know at all. Not at I read a lot of poems about my family, and I'm glad that uh, two of my favorites are selected for the book. This first one is uh, memories of my two sons. Uh, one section, uh, my older son, Matthew, and the second section is my younger son, Gregory. The poem is called Passing Through. High above the soccer field, two flocks of starlings wheel and converge, folding together for a moment, two fields of energy passing through each other become one pulsing body before spinning apart as my son fakes past the sweeper and crosses the ball to the right forward, birds disappearing over trees. That night at the lake, Everything's still but for the sound of acorns hitting rocks on the shore. My younger son and I walked to the bridge and leaned on the wooden rail in a light, warm breeze off the marsh, silently watching as water skimmers made a mosaic of the full moon. The blurred ghost image slowly focused, and I could feel the fine hair of his arm against mine before we turned and ambled back to the others in that clear light. This is called For My Son, Age Three Months, that age when uh, no part of your body seems under control. <laughs> so hard to do anything with it, this body. Hands fit in mouth, grab at noses, feet twitch and kick in the useless air. Little conductor without a score, what's out there? Stare it in the eye, watch it smile or cry, learning the limits. This search never stops for gestures that work, bodies to hold, hoping for more, the perpetual song. Graffiti Five Poets, Michael Huff, Interview, it, it Market. Out, you know, it starts out as a very natural experience. You're just living out in the world. You live in the country, you drive into the city, you see bugs, you know, and it's just an experience that's very ordinary. And you start describing it. And, and I think I usually, when I start writing a, poet, a poem, I start out as a nature poet, just describing things that I've seen. And, and then it begins to dawn on me that hey, there's something to that. You know, that these, for example, these long-lived aquatic creatures become a beautiful little flying thing for a brief period, and they're so ethereal, and uh, they don't have mouths. Yeah, right. They they don't eat. I mean, so you can pick up a mayfly or any kind of you know, they, they can't bite you or anything, because all they live for is light and love. Change of life. You see them swarming around the lights at the gas station, the May people. They've lived decades like the rest of us, wingless, earthbound, mucking after so many hungers, mandibles never stopping. Then, at what seems the end of a long and busy life, they become still at the surface of things, encrusted in amber or crystal. Time passes, and one day, always unexpected, they slip from their husks and rise into the night on double pairs of wings fluid as water. The moon glowing through their slim, supple bodies, skin and organs shining like alabaster lit from within. And they have no mouths and only two hungers, light and love, 
and just months to live after decades of mucking. This happened to our grandmothers, which didn't surprise us, but also to hoary old Doug Emert, who owned the tavern down the road, but not for some reason to our grandfathers or to the recently deceased president. Maybe the hunger for light and love has to be there already, however lost among all the other hungers in our mucking larval stage. Maybe it's luck or special secretions, the way bee pupa are made into queens, or maybe it's a rare nutrient found in some pools but not in others. In any case, when you feel yourself slowing down, hardening into crystal or amber, there is hope if you feel inexplicably drawn to the lights at the gas station, but that alone isn't enough. You must also crave love with everyone, everyone who rides the bus mumbling with bad teeth and fish breath, then the aching back, the wings coming through, of course, and slowing down our reason only to smile till you burst. For Noah, who stands fiddling by the door of the ark, one, in the voice of someone who didn't rate a mention in the book of Genesis. There were giants in the earth in those days, but we didn't care. It wasn't Eden, but it was close. We stayed young for centuries, sat in the grass all day eating the rays of the sun, pulling them down like pomegranates, breaking them apart, sunlight staining our fingers and stinging our small cuts. The sharp juice ran down our throats and our cold places melted. Flowers bloomed in our bellies. There were great harvests of song and laughter and we spat the shining seeds back at the sky. Two, a happy drowning, no regrets. You were just a youth of 600 when you closed the doors, so we bore you no malice as we drowned. There was no swimming in those days, so none of us knew how, but we were still tapping to the tunes you had played on your bass fiddle as the animals walked up the ramp. It was the best show we'd ever seen, and the melodies and rhythms never left our heads. Tapping and clapping kept us afloat for a while, kind of like swimming, and we hummed as best we could to repeat your music, which finally we recognized as thunder and the voice of God. And it felt good coming up through our throats before burbling out, and even the burbling sounded good. Graffiti right, Five right, Poets right. interviews well, I, Jane Julius Honchel, Market. I like to cloak serious things and funny things because it's just more manageable for me that way. I think, right. you know, it's just just easier to deal with it, and I feel like it's more acceptable to other people. I suppose. Yeah. I don't know where this poem came from, to tell you the truth. I, I actually think that it came from a dream. I remember waking up one morning and I was breathing in and out, and I was, the words Gobi and Sahara were running through my head, and I guess it was, you know, the uh, little muse saying, well, you better write something. So the only things that you probably have to know about this poem is that there are some words in here that are all uh, names of desert winds of various kinds. There's Harmaton, Kamsin, Sirocco, and Shamal. So just in case you were wondering what the heck they were. This is called This Breathing. In the deserts, Harmaton, Kamsin, Sirocco, and Shamal, builders and destroyers are gathering, mounding, sculpting elliptical curves, undulate and pure, then slicing, shifting, winnowing away until sand's flat line stretches to the edge of imagining. From abyssal plains, the moon assembles the waters, pushing waves to swell and surge, crash and break, drawing them out and under, neap and rip, ebb and flow, so regular we know to the minute when one breath will start and end on any given day. At the edge of the world, where sand and water meet and breathe together, I whisper, Gobi, Sahara, Gobi, Sahara, until tide, wind, breath, pull in and let go together.
And the last poem I'd like to read is um, one night at our, at our writer's group, Robert read this terrific poem whose name I can't recall, but it was about what's after life. And it really got me thinking, and David and I were talking about it, and so we were, we were sort of contemplating the afterlife, and I, I felt like I sort of had to, at first I was gonna write this rebuttal, but, uh, but I don't, anyway, I sort of changed my mind. Uh, it's called Valediction. We're all three middle-aged now, delicately probing the dark with the tips of our pens, examining its contents, trying it on for size. Dugan does not believe the tunnel, the light, or our dear departed waiting with outstretched arms or hovering on puff clouds and plucking various stringed instruments will be there. David agrees, and I too suspect only the long night awaits us. But what can I do but stumble on, extracting what joy remains from indigo buntings at the feeder, Swiss chard wilting in garlicky oil, slow saxophone solos, the scent of rubbed rosemary, a well-turned phrase, clean sheets, your touch. We write our twilight lines to come to terms, to muffle the screech our fingernails will make as we slide over the last precipice into the abyss. I'd like to think I'll sink down into the deep of sleep, grateful and serene, but I know better. I want to know what happens in the busy human hive after my last flight, eavesdrop on my offspring, see the denouement before I stand at Tunnel's mouth, open-armed to welcome them. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed our graffiti. I'm Tom Blomain. See you.